What's going on, Clutch Squad? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy Dup. It's your boy Ross. And we in the Clutch, baby. Hey. Back to you, ladies and gentlemen, with another bitch of the day. You feel me? Back with another Mr. Ballin' video. It's been a minute since we checked out Mr. Ballin'. Ballin'. The, sh the shocking end to a camping dream. Two tales that will water your eyes. Oh, mm. boy. Oh, man. Uh-oh. All right, we're, we're going to check this out. Should be interesting. Y'all already know Mr. Ballin's always great with the storytellings and how he set up these stories for us to, you know, kind of digest. So should be a very interesting one. Let's see if it does make our eyes uh, water just a bit. Let's get right into this one. Should be a good one, man. Let's go. Today, I'm going to share two totally weird medical mysteries. Warm but before balling. we get into those stories, really, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and I ain't trying to cry though. In story format, yeah, I know. Already shit right my tears because that's yesterday. all we do, and we upload once a week. So, if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button is out of town, sneak into their house and prop open their refrigerator door, and then just leave. Also, Mr. please subscribe Wong to our Ballin. channel and turn on all notifications so you don't Are miss. Are telling people to break it in it? Uploads. Okay, let's get into <laughs> yeah, to the like button house. Yeah. Number two, the shadow. On the evening of July 25th, 2008, a 59 year old man named Brian Thomas walked hand in hand with his wife, Christine, out of the restaurant where they had just had dinner. The couple mm. was in this little village right on the coast of Wales and where they were now walking outside of this restaurant was right along the water. And so as they did that, Brian found himself looking out over the sea and he saw the reflection of the moon on the waves and it was so beautiful. And then he turned to his wife and she was so stunning. And so Brian finally just stopped and kind of just took in all this incredible beauty right in front of him. And he began smiling ear to ear, which was a big departure from how Brian had been feeling over the past few months because Christine had recently had a big scare. She'd been told she might have cancer. And so she went in for all this testing and then she and Brian had to wait for it to come back. And the wait was absolute torture. I mean, basically Brian and Christine yeah. were prepping themselves to find out Christine really did have cancer. But when the results did come back, it would turn out Christine did not have cancer. And so Christine was obviously hugely relieved, but it was actually Brian who was more relieved. It was like he suddenly saw he could lose his wife, his wife of 40 years, Ew. who he had raised a family with. I mean, this was like the most important person in Brian's life, but it was like he didn't fully appreciate that until he realized he mm. could lose this really important person. It'd be so like now this that Christine time. had a clean bill of health, Brian was committed to showering her with love and affection and taking her to restaurants and on vacations. And in fact, the reason they were actually in this village in Wales is because they were on one of Brian's many vacations for Christine. He had gone out and bought this little camper van and they had driven it up to this part of Wales. And then after hmm. this vacation ended, Brian's plan was to use this camper to travel with his wife all over Great Britain. And so the couple had a really busy schedule coming up. But for right now, Brian was focused on just staying in the moment and enjoying this newfound happiness he was feeling. And so he and his wife would continue to just kind of walk along the water for a bit. And then finally, when they felt tired, they headed back to their camper, they went inside, they got in their bed, and they fell asleep. A little before 4 a.m., Brian suddenly woke up inside of this camper. And so he sits upright and he looks around. You know, it's totally dark inside of there. He can't see anything. He doesn't really know why he just woke up. And he's trying to get his bearings. And then as his eyes kind of begin to focus, he realizes there is a person standing inside of their camper right near the door. Basically 10, 15 feet away from he and his wife is a person. And so Brian just froze and he's staring at this person, hoping this is just a dream or something. But then this person who appeared to be dressed in all black head to toe began to move. And they began to move first to the left and then towards the bed. And so Brian is still just frozen thinking, is this real? Is this nah, really it's happening? Time to get up and then this click. person. <sighs> yeah. Oh, honey, Shh, go back to sleep. Baby. Go right back to sleep. Oh yeah, that's, that's... actually cover your ears. Cause yeah whatever this thing is it's not gonna be here in a few seconds i'm going i'm i'm emptying the clip i'm emptying the clip jeez man it began climbing on the bed on the side where christine was and so brian without even thinking just yelled out you bastard and he jumped off the bed at the sky <laughs> you bastard he waited too long 
Right, bro. Honest, hey, nah, bro. I, if I wake up and see a figure, I'm I'm gonna figure out later yeah, whether that was bro, really a figure. Or not. <laughs> Too long. As soon as nah, bro, you hop out that bed and you you get to work. <laughs> That's it, bro. That's not enough time for you to crawl on the bed. Yeah, nah, you ain't nah. You get to work at least. You know, you know, I get. My lady, you know what I'm saying? She'll be aware. And you know what I'm saying? We may have to tag team you too. Yeah. <laughs> you get, you, hey, you're going to get jumped in that camper, bro. <laughs> that whole going to be rocking. Yeah. They're like, what the fuck's going on in there? Hey, to the bang bang. Facts, bro. And then began choking them out. And the whole time, Brian is screaming at this person, like, what are you doing? Why are you here? And this person is fighting back so hard. And Brian is just not letting go. Ew. It's like instinct is completely taken over. And then this person goes totally still and just dies. And Brian knows he killed them, but they came into his camper. Like, what do you expect? Brian would ultimately be the one who called the police. And just several minutes later, they would show up. And when they got there, they would find Brian standing outside the camper, hyperventilating. And then when they tried to get more information about what exactly had happened inside the camper, Brian basically couldn't explain it. It was like he was totally in shock. Uh, I'm I'm having a very bad feeling about this. Yeah. Yep. I. Yeah. And so eventually, one of the officers just went inside the camper, and there on the ground, they would find a body. But it was not some attacker. It was Brian's wife. It would turn out Brian had a medical condition called somnambulism, oh, which we know as oh. sleepwalking. And at home, he would sleep in a different bed than his wife because he sleepwalked so much. But since they were on vacation in their camper, they oh. had to sleep together. Because no. there was only one bed on board the camper. And so Bro, not long she wasn't calling Brian his name or nothing. Falling asleep together, Brian began having this really intense nightmare where he believed his wife was being attacked. And so Brian, in this nightmare, had to stop this person from hurting Christine. Except, because of his sleepwalking, he acted this out in real life. And That's the attacker wild. that he ultimately killed was ironically his wife. Oh. He basically tackled his wife and strangled her to death oh. because he thought he was actually oh. saving her. Brian was absolutely destroyed with grief and with guilt. Oh, and the second yeah, he that's... realized what he had done, he confessed. He didn't in any way try to protect himself. He said, I did this, take me in. And Brian would be arrested. However, in November of 2009, the judge who actually heard Brian's official confession he kind of felt bad for Brian and said, you know what? I'm dropping all charges against you because it's obvious to me you are a good and decent person. Oh. This was a mistake and you're going to live with grief and guilt for the rest of your life. And that's punishment enough. Damn. That's tough, fam. Oh. Oh. Brian. That's, that's sad for real, bro. They, they, the way he set it up. They yeah. found out they didn't have cancer. <laughs> so they was like, traveling what? across the country oh. in the in the camper and God oh. damn it. That's man. that's yeah. You could tell that that fucks with you, bro. That will f I, I don't even want to know how that feels to 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 kill the person that you love the most. And it wasn't even like intentional. It wasn't mm -hmm. it was you literally were sleepwalking. You you thought you were in a dream. Thought you was in a nightmare. Yeah. Oh my god. Bro. And he didn't even try to. Yeah, he just like, hey, take me in, bro. Cause I, that, I, man, that's sad. That is sad. I ain't gonna hold you, bro. If you don't know this, late Jeez. last year we launched bro, a brand that, new, that, that strange, one, dark, and mysterious show. Of 2016. Only you can save her. Right. One morning in January of 2016, oh. a 45-year-old woman named it Lauren off walked heavy. into an office building in West Virginia heavy. where she worked yeah. as an office manager, Super heavy. and she dropped her purse, her phone, and her cigarettes on her desk. It was a Friday, and so Lauren was in a really good mood because she was pumped about the weekend. The next day, Saturday, she and her husband Dan planned to go on this big hike together. They loved hiking, so that was going to be awesome. And then on Sunday, Lauren planned to stay home all day and cook one big meal because it had become a tradition in their family that on Sundays, Lauren and Dan's kids, they had three kids who were all grown up, they would come back home to their parents' house and they would have a big family meal together. Okay. And these dinners were definitely the highlight of the week for Lauren and for Dan because both of them were very family-centric. 
Lauren switched on her computer and then looked at her schedule and saw she had a whole bunch of meetings back to back to back that day. And so immediately she was worried that she would not be able to slip out that day and go for a quick walk, something she had recently been doing a lot of because her doctor had recently told her that she had a blood circulation disorder that was called peripheral vascular disease. And what that meant was the arteries that carried the blood from her heart down to her legs and her feet were becoming blocked. And so her legs and feet were not getting enough oxygen. So far, her only symptoms were the occasional leg cramp, but if the disease got worse, it could lead to pain and mobility issues and also heart attack and stroke. Luckily, Uh. Lauren's doctor told her that she didn't need medication. She just needed to quit smoking, change her diet and become more physically active. And Lauren had. All right, here we go. So this is this is this is the first thing. Yeah. Quit Quit smoking, smoking. change your diet, exercise. When you get those type of information, from the doctor, you I change. you got especially when it's dealing with arteries and potential stroke and heart attacks, you change. Yeah. So that's the that's the first major plot point of this particular situation here. Totally leaned into this and was being much more active and had changed her diet. She hadn't quit smoking yet, but she planned to. And so Lauren really felt like she was on the right track. And so as Lauren kind of began her day, you know, going through her emails and thinking about when she's going to do this walk, her cell phone rang. When Lauren looked at the phone, she didn't recognize the number, so she decided to let it go to voicemail. And so Lauren forgot about her phone and just figured whoever this was, you know, they'd call back or whatever, and she's doing her thing. But then she got another phone call. And when she looked, it was the same number calling her back. Uh And this time, Lauren did pick up the phone. And when she said hello, on the other end of the line, she heard a police officer say in a very serious voice, am I speaking to Dan's wife? And so right away, Lauren's heart began to race and she would tell the officer, yes, you know, what's going on? And all the officer would tell her is that Dan, unfortunately, was in a very serious car accident. Oh, no. And so yeah. you need to come to the scene right away. Oh. In an absolute <clears throat> panic, Lauren hung up the phone. She grabbed her thing. She ran out to the car and she floored her way to the address the police officer gave her. But when she got there, she saw there were so many police cars and ambulances and all these people that she couldn't even see what was going on, let alone park anywhere near where this accident happened. So she wound up parking her car around the corner and then she got out and just sprinted towards all the police. And then when she got up to them, she basically began pushing people out of the way and no one tried to stop her. They could tell, you know, this woman must know the people involved in this crash. And so she pushed past all these people and finally she can see through the crowd and she can see her husband's car and it's absolutely mangled. And there's Damn. all these first responders that are in a circle on the pavement oh. and she can tell there is somebody on the ground they're working oh, on oh. and it's got to be Dan. And so Lauren just began running towards that group of people and as she did, they all stood up as if, you know, there was nothing they could do. And on the ground, Lauren saw her husband. There was Dan lying in this huge pool of blood just motionless on the ground and so before she even got over to her husband lauren already knew what had happened dan was dead and so lauren let out this primal shriek and just rushed over to her husband and fell to the ground next to him holding his body and crying hysterically and all the emts and first responders you know they knew this woman has just lost her husband and even though she shouldn't be here right now They just felt like they have to give this moment to her. And so the police and the EMTs and the rest of the first responders, instead of even talking to Lauren or trying to get her to go somewhere else, they just formed a big circle shoulder to shoulder around Lauren and Dan and just allowed Lauren to grieve in private. About two hours later, Lauren returned to her home in a daze. Dan's body had already been transported to the morgue and a police officer had driven Lauren back to her home where her three kids, her son and her two daughters, were now waiting for her. And so when Lauren went inside the house and went into the living room where her kids were, her kids, who already knew what had happened, they just immediately swarmed her and hugged her and they all just cried together. I mean, this was so horrible and so unexpected that nobody knew what to do. Finally, Lauren tried to speak through her sobs, but when she did, she just couldn't get words out. It was like her chest was so tight she couldn't even speak. No. And then suddenly, Lauren no. realized this pressure on her chest no. was very real, no. and it was getting worse and worse, to the point where it was genuinely hard to take a breath in. Oh, no. And so Damn. Lauren actually said to her kids, I think I'm having a panic attack. <clears throat> and so her daughter ran to the kitchen to get some water, and as she did, Lauren took a seat on the couch to try to calm down, 
But by the time her daughter came back with the glass of water, Lauren straight up just could not breathe. I mean, she was trying to pull air in, but it wasn't going in, and she was totally panicking. Damn. And so she looked at her kids and just mouthed the words, I can't breathe. At which point the kids understood, like, this is way beyond just grief and sadness. Like, she's having a physical emergency right now. And so one of Lauren's daughters picked up the phone and called 911. A few minutes later, an ambulance arrived and they would take Lauren to a local hospital. But as soon as they got there, the doctors and nurses determined that very likely Lauren had had a heart attack. And even though she was basically stable right now, their fear is she was gonna have another one. And this particular local hospital just lacked the resources and staff oh, to actually yeah. treat Lauren. And so they pretty much immediately transferred Lauren to another hospital called the JW Memorial Hospital in Morgantown, West Virginia, because that hospital had a specialized cardiac care unit for people with very serious heart problems. Dr. Conard Failinger was the cardiologist on duty at JW Memorial Hospital when Lauren was brought into the intensive care unit, followed closely behind by her three adult children. Now, Dr. Failinger was used to seeing worried families in the hospital, but Lauren's kids looked far more distressed than he was used to seeing. And when he spoke to Lauren's kids about, you know, what's going on with Lauren, he would see why. The doctor would learn that this family has lost their father, their husband, just a few hours earlier. That's and wild. the mother, Lauren, who's Same this patient, day. you know, she laid with her dead husband out on the road in a pool of blood. That's and now crazy. these poor kids who've just lost their father, they're seeing their mother go to the ICU for what looks like a heart attack. I mean, this was a total worst case scenario <clears throat> where basically everything was going wrong for this family. Dr. Failinger did his best to push his emotions to the side. He didn't want to get wrapped up emotionally in this case. But at the same time, the doctor felt a very deep need to save Lauren. Like, let this family have one good thing happen to them. Yeah. But right. Lauren's condition was pretty dire. Just like the doctors at that local hospital where Lauren went first, Dr. Failinger also suspected Lauren had a heart attack, very likely because of that blood circulation disorder that she had that basically clogged her arteries. When an artery in the heart gets blocked, the blood can't circulate in the heart, yeah. and so the heart dies. And preliminary testing on Lauren showed there was already signs of damage to her heart, Aww. in the same way that a heart attack would damage a heart. Her heartbeat was also irregular and it was too fast and her blood pressure was dangerously low. Uh, and then also when Dr. Fallinger looked at some imaging of Lauren's heart, he could see that the majority of her heart muscle wasn't even moving. Basically, oh. Lauren's heart was working way harder and way faster than it should be to accomplish nothing. And so right. very quickly, Dr. Fallinger realized that unless he was able to find the blocked artery in Lauren's heart and clear it, that Lauren would die. And so Dr. Failinger looked up at Lauren's three kids who were just standing there in silence, waiting for more bad news. And Dr. Failinger said to them, your mom needs to go into surgery right now. Nurses wheeled Lauren out of the ICU Woo! into surgery where she was immediately put under anesthesia. Once Lauren was ready, Dr. Failinger watched on a monitor as another surgeon fed a thin flexible tube called a catheter into an artery in Lauren's leg and then fed it up towards her heart. Wow. This surgery was called cardiac angioplasty. Basically, mm -hmm. that surgeon was going to use that catheter, that tube, and put it into Lauren's heart and then shoot dye through that catheter tube into the blood in Lauren's heart. And then Dr. Fallinger and the other doctors could watch to see where this dye went. If the dye was pumped out of the heart like it should be, they'd see it go in all different directions. But if at some point on the monitor, the dye just stopped inside the heart and didn't go anywhere, then that would mean they found a blockage. And so when the surgeon had the catheter in Lauren's heart, he injected the dye and they all watched on the monitor and her heart functioned completely fine. There was no blockage in her heart. Now, the doctors weren't entirely convinced yet that there was no blockage, so they pulled that catheter out and they got a different one and they went through the exact procedure all over again to see if maybe that catheter was malfunctioning. But again, that second time, the dye didn't stop anywhere. Her heart seemed to be functioning totally normally. And so Dr. Fallinger and the rest of the doctors and surgeons, they were all totally baffled because what this meant was whatever was happening to Lauren or whatever did happen to Lauren was not a heart attack. But make no mistake, Lauren's heart was still absolutely dying. It was just some other thing killing it. 
Hey, we appreciate you, J Cap, with the get the 10 uh uh 10 of them. Appreciate 10 that. Of, uh, tier one subs. We appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for that, J Cap, bro. Dr. Fallinger went back to the drawing board, but realistically, there just weren't that many other things to consider with regards to what was happening to Lauren. Heavy alcohol use could, in theory, cause what was happening to Lauren, but Lauren didn't drink. Infection was another option, but Lauren showed no signs of having an infection. Certain chemotherapy. Okay, all right, right. y'all boys are here. Big anime fan with the <laughs> gifting ten uh, tier one subs. Hey, uh, we appreciate that. I don't know what's going on, but hey, we we appreciate y'all, man. Thank y'all so much for that, man. Drugs have been known to damage the heart, but Lauren wasn't on chemo and certainly would not have accidentally been exposed to chemo drugs without knowing about it. And so basically, Dr. Fallinger had no clue what was wrong with Lauren, and he didn't even know where to start. And so Dr. Fallinger just sat in his office feeling so bad about the fact that, you know, these kids are almost certainly gonna lose their other parent. I mean, it was his duty to save Lauren and he couldn't do it. And he just felt so bad. He couldn't even imagine how he was gonna deliver the news to the kids that, you know, your mom's gonna die and we don't know why. I mean, this was the worst for Dr. Fallinger. He felt like he had failed as a doctor. But just then, Dr. Fallinger has this epiphany. He remembers this weird medical article he had read somewhat recently, and he realized what was going on with Lauren and her family was like the same thing that happened in that article. And because Dr. Fallinger did not have any other ideas of how to handle what was going on with Lauren, he decided he would just try to do what they did in that article. Because if he was wrong, he had nothing to lose. So Dr. Fallinger got up and he ran to Lauren's to hospital Dr. room. Fallinger. And when he got in there, he saw Lauren's kids and he called them over to him. And he would tell them that he's going to give their mom some medication that's going to spike her blood pressure and keep it high. But then he needs them to gather around her and just talk to her like she's your mom. Talk lovingly, soothingly, remind her that you're still here and that everything is okay. And the kids, they all agreed to do this. And then Dr. Fallinger, he gave the medicine to Lauren, and then he watched as her three kids circled up around the head of the bed, and they're all crying and holding their mom and telling her how much they love her and please come back to us, come back. And as they're doing this, Dr. Fallinger just quietly walked out of the room, hoping this would work. And sure enough, just a week later, Lauren was all better. It would turn out oh, the way in which wow. Lauren lost her husband, both the suddenness of getting that phone call combined yeah. with just the unthinkable horror of seeing your loved one on the road in a pool of blood dead. I mean, that situation was so stressful for Lauren so, so that nice. her brain released a Traumatic. ton of stress hormones into oh, her body. So wow. much so that these stress hormones literally paralyzed her heart. And Damn. so you can understand why all the doctors thought this was a heart attack because this sort of looked like one. But this condition does have its own name. It's called stress cardiomyopathy. What? However, it's known by its more casual name, which is broken heart syndrome. Basically, wow. Lauren loved her husband so much broken heart that syndrome. to witness what happened to him and to learn about it so suddenly and abruptly, it nearly killed her. And it just so happens that a few months before Lauren was checked into the hospital, Dr. Fallinger happened to read a medical article about Damn. broken heart syndrome. And That's the only way crazy. you can treat broken heart syndrome is just to try to keep the patient alive long enough that the stress hormones leave their body naturally, wow. at which point their heart goes back to normal. And so Dr. Fallinger was able to buy Lauren a little bit of time right at the end there by giving her that medicine that boosted her blood pressure. But Dr. Fallinger told her three kids that really it was up to them Damn. to keep their mother alive. They needed to crowd around their mom and just talk to her and tell her that you love her, you know, show her that you're here with her, give her a reason to fight and hold on. You know, even though she's not saying or doing anything, she's still alive and she can hear you. So talk to her. And so Lauren's kids just sat wow. around their mother and just showered her with love and affection. Damn. And sure enough, a few days later, when Lauren did kind of come out of it and recover, she would say that she felt herself drifting off towards death. I mean, she really knew she was dying, but then she remembers hearing her kids calling wow. to her and saying how much they That's loved her. Awesome. Please come back. We need you. We already lost dad. We got to keep you. Damn. And Lauren would say, that's the reason she's still here today is because she held on for that's her tough. kids. That's she felt like tough, it was her bro. duty to be here for her family. And so that's what saved her life. Hey, Damn, all right, man. Bro. The I'm power of love. On, the, on, the, on the great note, man.
the power of love it could be dangerous but it can also it could potentially bring you bring you back you know in a situation like that where yeah, basically man. she came back because she hurt her kids that's crazy wow bro, bro. they've already been through such a traumatic event yeah the same day and God, to, God to, is good facts oh uh, yeah bro. man that is Woo! amazing bro and shout out shout out to the amazing doctors out there the fact that he just randomly saw that story read about that and like and hey let me let me see if this works Back. Shout out to the amazing doctors out there, bro. Yeah, and Jill, that's yeah. correct. She said when you stretch your body, it uses every line of defense to attack the stress hormone. So that's why you need to do things that produce uh, serotonin, which are the happy hormones. Stress is a real stress is a real disease. Stress, Back. it bro, can kill you. It's a For silent real. killer, and that's the thing. Like, it's real. You know, people don't realize that. That's why I was saying that earlier. Like, bro, we be really stressing over things that don't matter. Don't matter at all. Bro. And we be this wondering why some people on these islands be living till they 108. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just be on their island chilling, facts. having fun, not, you know, subscribing to things that everybody else talks. Bro, just enjoy. Nah, this was uh this was this was a dope one right here, man. I love this. Yeah, no, nah, for sure. It, it ended off on a on a much better note, a uh, much positive note. Uh, a note. Uh, this is it's the power of love, bro. The power uh, of love always trumps everything. Power of love, bro. You'd be surprised what you can do with just loving someone and how that can fuel it and help somebody else. So, no, nah, facts, but hey, if y'all enjoyed it, please make sure you run up the likes, spread some love, be sure. love. That's all we talk about over here. You feel me? Sure. So, continue to share our videos and run up the likes and let us know what, what else y'all want us to check out next. Have a good one. Peace out. Already. Bitches from Houston. If you got a problem, then we got the solutions. And there's no illusion. I made this shit happen. I'm living life lucid. I'm switching my strategies. Now they hate on me because I'm causing casualties. But why are they after me? Deep inside, they know they can't handle half of me.